And it's great to be with you this evening and thanks for sparing the time to join our webinar. Um, we've got over 100 people on and it's still rising and we had over 200 registered for this event, which shows that uh, despite the horrors of COVID and uh, um, all that's been happening over recent months, people are still very concerned about our relationship with Europe and the long run effects of the trade and cooperation agreement and all the other changes that have been made. And that's why we're having this discussion this evening, because there are big and urgent issues. There are big and urgent issues about what's going to happen to our communities and their vitality and their economies across the country. The trade figures out today for the first three months of the year still show a systemic decline in trade with the EU. We're now back uh, year on year to roughly our same level of trade with non-EU countries that we were a year ago, but we're nearly 20% down with the EU. So there's a, a big, big economic dividends that we're uh, losing as a result of Brexit. This is having a big impact across the country. And of course, lo lots of people have lost their rights. In a sense, everyone's lost their rights. We've all lost European citizenship. But those of our um, fellow residents who didn't have British citizenship and came from the EU have faced a particular problem in having to regularise their status post Brexit. And that's another big theme which uh, we want to discuss this evening too. So I'm really delighted that we've got uh, two colleagues who are going to kick off our discussion. Uh, Belinda Pratton from uh, Equi Hours, which is a network of equalities-based organisations across the country, who's going to talk about the impact of Brexit nationwide. And Luke Piper from, I say it's the three million, but I wonder whether they should rename themselves the four and a half million, because actually it turns out there are far more than three million who, have, um, uh, uh, who, are, who are here, who are, EU but non-British citizens who of course have had these huge issues about their status and even now even with the settled status there are more than a third of a million whose forms haven't been processed because of course the uh, uh, the process is very slow and we've had a Covid effect too. So big and important issues we've got to discuss and Belinda has very kindly agreed to start she's going to make a presentation to us and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions after and I'd be grateful for, um, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll kick off the questions too, but if people want to post questions in the Q&A, uh, I will uh, either seek to pose them directly myself, or if I'm able to bring you in, because uh, my techni technical wizards are in the background and they may be able to do it. And then we'll move on to, to Luke, and then he'll make a presentation and we'll have about 20 minutes of questions to him. So, Belinda, thank you very much for joining us. I uh, do begin by telling us about Equally Hours, because not everyone will know, and uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Over to thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you very much for inviting me along, and it's great that there are so many people here today to, to discuss these really important issues. Equally Hours is a UK-wide charity that basically brings together people and organisations working across equality, human rights and social justice to make a reality of all of these in people's lives. So Brexit has been quite a key issue for us on many fronts. Um, the, the front that I've been working on specifically and that I want to talk about today is what happens to EU funding and particularly the proposed UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, so I'd like to begin, if the technical wizards could help, uh, with a film that we did that has shown the impact of EU funding on, on people who really are furthest from the labour market and who've really benefited from that dedicated funding. So if we could have the film, I'm, um, that would be great. What we've been trying to do here over the last period of time is provide an environment which allows people to express their creativity for either professional purposes, for educational purposes or for, for social purposes. I went to university and I did drama for three years and then I came out and I went straight into retail which was awful. I then got diagnosed with autism and so I was in this state where I wasn't leaving the house, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I took out a membership here in which I come in and I create and make jewellery and then I sell it. Starting my business here has given me the confidence to be able to go out and make those connections. So now I'm able to move my life forward. What 
is amazing for me is the fact that last year I won Entrepreneur of the Year. It was completely bizarre. It was so surreal because I'd gone from this shy person to yeah, you've won Entrepreneur of the Year. We work with women across Wales from different backgrounds, from different industries, with different level of skills, with the sole purpose of upskilling them, developing their confidence, and ultimately enabling them to improve their own labour market position. I'm a mechanical design engineer, but at the moment I'm working in research and technology. The reason why I wanted to do the ILM course is because I'm aspiring to be a leader within my organisation. It opened my eyes on what leadership was really about. I've always wanted to do a PhD and that involves believing in myself, believing in my skills, believing in my capabilities. Doing this course made me realise that I could. I work as a business analyst and systems developer. I was made redundant in about 2001. Over the years since I've missed out on a lot of training and development opportunities and especially being a woman and also trans that puts me at a bit of a disadvantage. Since I finished the course, I've applied for one particular role that I'm interested in, and they've come back and they've offered me a first interview. And I only found that out this morning, so I'm very pleased about that. So we run courses for woodlands, environment, uh, countryside, uh, horticulture, and carpentry and construction and upcycling furniture uh, to give people who are furthest away from the employment market, many with different barriers, the opportunity to learn new skills and to progress towards employment or whatever it is to improve their lives. I was a carer. I was looking after my parents for about four years cooking, doing the housework, and then um, once they passed away, then I got evicted. So last year I was homeless for a while. That was a complete jolt, a complete wake up call. With this place, I can use now as a reference and I can say to an employer, I've got actual experience doing it. And I'll get a qualification at the end of it. It's kind of given you, me a bit of um, compass bearing. Yeah, it's like I've got somewhere that's solid ground. Thank you, and, and I think that um, says better than I can the significant impact that EU funding has had on local people, local projects and, and people's lives. I've been working with Equally Hours since 2018 when I was uh, brought in for six months to help them develop their response to what was then seen to be an imminent consultation on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which is designed to replace EU funding. And at that time, you know, we were expecting it imminently, but here we are three years later, and we really don't know that much more. So one of the things I want to do today is tell you what little we do know, uh, why it's desperately needed, uh, and, and also what we'd like to see um, very briefly. So what we've been told so far about the UK SPF is that it's likely to be in two parts. So one part is going to be more focused on the most disadvantaged places um, and the other on people, particularly those furthest from the labour market, getting them back uh, into employment or helping them find employment, with the two overlapping. Uh, the other thing that we do know is that it's likely to be um, the flagship policy for the levelling up agenda. Um, but again, we don't know very much about that either. Um, we do know that Neil O'Brien MP has been appointed to write the strategy. Um, we, we don't know where that's going to be. So at the moment, uh, the two separate bits are being led on by MHCLG, the Ministry for uh, Housing, Communities and Local Government. They're leading on the place aspect. DWP are leading on um, the people aspect, and then the cabinet office is actually writing the strategies. So how this is gonna play out, we're not quite sure. But whether or not it makes a real difference to people's lives will really depend on the detail. And it's that detail that, that we really don't know at the moment. I think it is important, as you can see from the film, that the UK SPF um, focuses on people as well as places. It was one of our main concerns that it was gonna focus on 
geographical inequality. Nevertheless, if it is going to make a real difference, then it's going to need to acknowledge so the very deep-rooted inequalities in opportunity and outcomes experienced by people because of their ethnicity, their age, their gender, their disability, or indeed their social class. And I think the need for this funding has become actually more apparent during COVID. The pandemic has exposed and, and worsened long-standing structural and systemic inequality in the UK. We've seen how discriminated and uh, discrimination and disadvantage have combined to leave particular groups, again, Black and Asian communities, women, disabled people, a much higher risk, not only of COVID, but also of its wider social and economic impact. So over the last year, it has shown us that inequalities in housing, in health, in education, in employment, not only lead to um, loss of potential, but ultimately it leads to loss of life as well. So we know, and the evidence from the organizations that we work with proves that tackling discrimination and disadvantage in all its forms is fundamental to creating this just and inclusive society that we all want to see. So in theory, at least, it should also be fundamental to the leveling up agenda and the UK SPF. I know the UK SPF is intended to be a completely new fund, um, not just straightforward replacement. But I've always think it's important not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And there are, I think, some key lessons that we could learn about uh, the way that EU funding has worked that would be really useful to take forward into any new, new fund. About three years ago, we published research that showed that EU funding had made a real difference to people like those that you saw in our film. But the reason it did that is because equality was actually designed in to, to the programme itself. That every single funding programme was required to address equality and social inclusion. In addition, specific funds had additional priorities. So ESF, for example, was also expected to address uh, poverty and discrimination. Participation targets that ensured that yeah, it really increased its reach and impact much more than other similar types of funds. So it really could support people like Jenny, uh, like Martin, like Kate, and make a real difference to their lives. As importantly, having these goals embedded within the way it's designed meant that more than half of the 9.3 billion allocated to the UK in the last spending round, that's from 2014 to 2020, was linked in our research, we could link it back to targets uh, associated with equality objectives. That's a significant amount of funding. And that's why this funding has been a lifeline to marginalized people and communities and also to the organizations that support them. We don't want to lose that lifeline, which is why we want to see similarly explicit objectives to protect and promote equality in the UK SPA. Indeed, we'd like it to go further than EU funding um, and give those objectives exactly the same prominence as economic objectives. It shouldn't be either or, it must be both and. What we know is that there's still some way to go from this. So you know, the two funds that we do know about, the Leveling Up Fund and the Community Renewal Fund, the prospectuses for both of those say that the UK government and local authorities should pay due regard to the public sector equality duty. That means that that's from the Equality Act 2010, and it means that they should consider the impact of any proposals on people with protected characteristics under the Act. But it is also clear that that should not be a determining factor in the way decisions are taken. We don't think that's good enough. If the levelling up agenda is to mean anything, it must mean tackling unfair differences between individuals and groups. 
And it must mean giving us the tools to create the stronger, fairer and more compassionate UK that we all want to see. So for us, we think that means that the UK SPF must be designed to explicitly and intentionally tackle inequality and advance equality. For those of you who are Star Trek fans, that must be its prime directive. Deciding what that means locally should be determined by local authorities, not by central government. And it should therefore reflect the particular opportunities and challenges for local people and local economies. Yes, there should be a fair and transparent funding formula agreed nationally to ensure that investment is allocated according to need. But detailed spending plans should be developed locally, a genuine partnership between councils, local people, communities, civil society and business. It should go further than um, EU funding in that respect. The reason that we say that is because those who are closest to the grassroots have the greatest understanding of the challenges that people face and how these can be overcome. Specialist equality organizations and community groups, such as those that we saw in the film, they have a unique contribution to make here. Many are led by the people from the communities that they serve or have direct personal experience of the issues that they're addressing. And when it comes to giving people the opportunity to learn new skills, to build their confidence, progress towards employment, or whatever it is that will improve their lives, these organizations have shown that they can really deliver. And again, I think our film proves that. Yet the combined effects of COVID and austerity have squeezed these organizations dry. They've been hit much harder than mainstream voluntary organizations. So we'd also like to see an element of ring fencing built into the UK SPF to build the capacity of these organizations so that they, and more importantly, the people that they work with can really play a full part in the design and delivery of UK SPF funded programs. And they can therefore ensure that the funding reaches the people that needs it most. Designed right, the UK SPF can help to build a fairer, as well as a more prosperous society and an economy that works for everyone. But that means in order to do that, it means that tackling inequality must be part of the DNA of the SPF. It must be part of its core purpose. It also means recognizing that discrimination and disadvantage go hand in hand. And you need to address both to increase opportunity and improve outcomes for it. And it means devolving power and resources to give local policymakers the flexibility to target interventions where it's needed most and could be most effective, and give local communities and organizations the scope to lead change in their areas. Thank you. Thanks very much, Belinda. That was really quite concerning, of course, because what it did was to highlight the uh, big losses there'll be and raise a whole lot of questions which we don't have answers to at the moment about what's going to come in its place. Uh, we've got about five minutes before we move on to Luke. Can I can I give you a few questions as a group, perhaps, Belinda, and then yeah. answer them together? Um, uh, actually, two which may enable you to 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 cover um, uh, two particular issues that are causing concern. Arno from West Sussex asks, what percentage of EU funding has been lost for your organisation, and what percentage are actually being provided um, by uh, likely replacement funds. Actually, I see Arno put it, the current cabal in UK government, but I won't use quite such a lo loaded term, but you know where he's coming from. Uh, so how badly hit the organisations that you're dealing with? What, what I mean, I, and I assume it, it varies widely, of course, but it'd be good to get some kind of a feel of what this means. The second question, um, for me is that I know all the debates in, in Westminster and Whitehall at the moment, a lot of them are focusing on the fact that because so many of these areas which are now quote unquote left behind or being leveled up supposedly now have conservative MPs and what uh, the government appears to be doing is 
essentially trying to create slush funds for those MPs. So you talked about equality principles and you talked about local authorities. Well, the big concern is that the prime um, uh, decision maker in how to allocate very large uh, uh, sums of money is in fact going to be local Tory MPs who might do it on straightforwardly partisan grounds as to how they choose to allocate the, this funding. Uh, now, of course, we can't affect that if that's what the government's going to do. It'll, it'll be a source of massive um, controversy if they do. But it does raise the issue about whether the groups that you're referring to and colleagues who are, who are uh, engaged in organisations that uh, that play in this space, shouldn't be seeking to address MPs directly too, because it's very clear that not just if they're Conservative MPs, but maybe particularly if they're Conservative MPs, that they're going to be playing quite a significant role in the allocation of um, the replacement funds. So I wonder whether you could just deal with those two issues, Linda, how badly hit typically are your organisations? And uh, in terms of seeking to secure replacement funding from the various funds, whether people should be seeking to uh, target MPs as well as local Yeah, no, that, that, that's really important. I, I think in, in terms of, you know, obviously it's a sort of fairly uneven spread of who was and wasn't getting EU funding, but I think one of the important things is that um, this funding was for uh, types of activities that alternatives aren't really available, reaching some of those really hard to reach groups. Um, and although it may not be a much in, in a sort of quantum um, amount, for some organisations it was a significant chunk of their funding. And, and if and when that goes, then those organisations uh, would really struggle to, to exist uh, with real impact on the people that they work with. So it's, it's the, the way, um, it's the lack of alternative funding for these sorts of activities. That has made it so precious, I think, rather than the sort of the, the quantum amounts very, very often. Um, in terms of what percentage there will be in future, who knows? I mean, we would like to say, see it at least the same amount um, being spent on the people aspect uh, as had been um, spent on the ESF, for example, as, as a crude um, comparator. But obviously, um, more than that, if possible. I, th I think the, the key thing is about, you know, we, we're concerned about funding mechanisms and how it's allocated. Um, and, and you're absolutely right that the, uh, the formulas do seem to favor particular types of constituency. And a lot of the um, information that has been given so far, though I, we have been told that it's still very much in flux, is that constituent constituency MPs um, could actually play a very key decision-making role. Um, I, I think you know, that that will vary from constituency to constituency as to how links, what links they have with some of these community groups. Um, but I think it's really important that um, you know, it's made clear to MPs what a difference these funds could make. And you know, I think, I, quite frankly, I'd much rather, personally, um, we'd much rather that actually the people most affected, that lived experience, have a say in these, the way that these decisions are made. And I'd like to see a much stronger emphasis on local partnerships, possibly with MPs, in terms of bringing together the, the people who are likely to be affected and to see what difference can this funding make to them and to their local economies. Well, thank you, Belinda. That was that was really helpful, and I hope it will be useful to people who are actually engaged in projects that have had SPF funding and looking for the replacement funds. An equally big issue is the three stroke four point five million of our fellow um, residents who have been hit badly by the loss of uh, EU citizenship and are going through uh, various different processes trying to establish their rights. To get settled status and so on. And Lucas can give us an update and tell us what are the particular issues that he thinks we should be focusing on as we take this forward, particularly as the application process comes to an end. So Luke, over to you. Thanks for joining us. 
thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the invitation and hello to you all. It's really great to see such a big number of people here um, today. Um, as Andrew said, I'm, I'm going to talk through some of the priorities that are um, impacting on EU citizens in the UK. So just by, by way of a brief introduction, so um, my name is Lee Piper, I'm Head of Policy at The Three Million, which is a campaign organisation, the largest EU citizens campaign organisation. And we set out to represent and advocate and give a voice to the millions of EU citizens that are living uh, in the UK and impacted by the UK's decision to leave the European Union. And Andrew is not the first to make a quip at our name, um, he won't be the last, um, but we anticipate that there will probably be five million odd people in this country with uh, some form of, of immigration status. Um, but, you know, these numbers are big. You know, the scheme that was set up was designed to regularise EU citizens' immigration status in this country. And it was supposed to be a means by which people could have their old rights protected um, as protected under the withdrawal agreement that was agreed between the UK and the EU. And the announcements that you will hear in the press and the statements that are made are that everything is great. We've had massive numbers apply, despite the fact that the numbers that have applied have far exceeded the estimates. So what are the problems? What are the issues that are presented um, to EU citizens at the moment? Um, well, for now, the main thing is people need to get their new status. They need to apply through the EU settlement scheme if they need, if they need to, and the majority of people do. Um, if they don't, um, there is a real risk and they must do so by the deadline, which is the end of June of this year. The serious consequences for those people who don't get their applications in, in time are that they will face the force of uh, the hostile environment and Siri very inconveniently listening in. Um, and sorry about this, I'll just sh shut her up. And, um, the hostile environment, which I'm sure is, is something that you will all be familiar with, but it's a set of measures to make life difficult for people who don't have a legal basis to be in the United Kingdom. This includes denying people the right to rent, the right to work, the right to access bank accounts, even the right to marry somebody, or even the right just to get a driver's license. These things are prohibited to you if you do not have a legal basis to be in this country. And whilst millions of people may have successfully acquired their new status, we have no idea of the numbers of people who have yet to apply or need to. There's a lot of research and a lot of analysis which has been undertaken, which has identified that the very likelihood of people who will not apply is some of the most vulnerable in our society, the older, the children, the disabled, and so forth. So that's just not the only concern. There's also the worries for those who have pending applications. And Andrew very kindly observed that there is close to 400,000 people who have outstanding applications with the Home Office. The time by which those decisions will be made is unknown. We know that the vast majority will probably be decided quite quickly, but for a lot of people, they will be pending decisions for a very long time. And that sort of limbo, whilst they may have some legal assurances, it will be difficult for them to navigate the hostile environment I was just speaking of before. Which leads me to the next issue, and this is one of the most pressing issues for EU citizens, um, as various reports, various surveys, various people that I speak to on a regular basis, um, is, the, is the outcome, the status that you receive in of, in of itself. And unlike everything else in life, um, to do with immigration, you don't get a physical document. You don't get a piece of paper that confirms what your immigration status is to live in this country. Um, you get, you have access to have to access some protracted digital status uh, via a drawn out, long winded uh, online process. And we have very, very serious concerns about the viability of um, the digital only system. 
And um, if you want to have a see how complex it is and the potential pitfalls, there's a little web page there with some in information about it. We've um, tried to persuade the government to think of alternatives, be imaginative, be creative, um, try and find a better way of doing the system that isn't on the basis of how it is now. And unfortunately, we felt that we were forced to issue legal proceedings against the government last year, sorry, the beginning of this year. And unfortunately, our case was defeated. And the reasons why we lost is that the Home Office argued that they have, um, they still have time to get their digital system ready. They still have everything ready to put in place that they have to do by July and that we didn't have the required evidence. And unfortunately, the judge agreed with that reasoning. And so whilst, whilst we've tried to prevent um, the potential calamity that will, people will face from digital status um, because they won't be able to access those things I was just talking about before. Um, we are now moving into what I like to call the REACT strategy. And very much part of the REACT strategy now is that we need people to tell us the problems that they are having with the digital only system. Um, it's only through building an evidence base and it's only through us understanding and, and seeing what the problems are that people are facing that we can build an argument and build a case to show why this is a problem. And to give you an example of the power of the evidence base so far that we've developed, um, I'm just going to post a, a link to a tweet that we did today, um, which set out some of the errors and some of the mistakes, some of the problems that people have had with accessing improving their status where the system has just simply failed with no means by which to correct it or remedy it. So now some of these people were just trying to open the bank account or some of these people were just trying to kind of prove to um, an employer that they had their status to be in this country and they faced these barriers. These are the people who had a voice and felt that they could tell us their stories, um, but it doesn't obviously cover everybody. And the real worry is, is that when people face these problems and aren't able to access and prove their status, they ultimately will fail to enforce their rights to be in this country. Um, so it's a real, it's a real, real worry for us. Um, there are many other um, points of concern, particularly around um, the way that the withdrawal agreement is being currently implemented. Um, earlier this year, we comp compiled and then submitted a report to the Independent Monitoring Authority, which is established to monitor the rights of citizens in this country, setting out all of the problems that we've identified to date. Most of those are still relevant today, and I've posted a link just now in, um, from our webpage. But the reason why I'm posting a link to a very dense report there is that these issues, these points of interpretation, these disagreements of uh, tensions, if you like, in the way that the withdrawal agreement is uh, being implemented by the UK um, is, is not great. And um, it appears that the UK is defaulting on its obligations under the withdrawal agreement to citizens' rights, its commitments to EU citizens in this country. Um, this is not widely reported in the news or in the press. Um, because it's not Northern Ireland, it's not fish, um, it's not, you know, stocks, it's not, you know, dead sheep or whatever, not to, you know, diminish the importance of uh, goods and products, but these are real lives, these are people that we are talking about. And we are seeing an emerging trend now of um, this becoming an emerging issue of tension between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Um, and anybody who's interested in diplomatic language, just take a look at the latest statement, joint statement between the EU and the UK. Um, this is not a statement that is produced by people who are on the same page and on the same side as each other. This is a statement that's been produced by two parties who are in fundamental disagreements about the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Um, and you will see, there's some key points in there that if you are a uh, good at picking out diplomatic language, you can see that they, they are, there are points of tension between the UK and the EU. Why am I showing that? Well, the worry is, is that we will find ourselves back in a situation um, in, 20, in 2016 when EU citizens were put, were put on the table and they were turned into bargaining chips. The worry is, is that we will find ourselves again in a situation where the UK can't deal with the Northern Irish issue they will then start to start squabbling over our rights. 
as well as the rights of British citizens in the United Kingdom. And there's a, it's, a, it's a troubling trend that's emerging. Now, the, the, that, all of that doom and gloom, all of that negativity that I've just ch ch charged this, uh, this webinar with, um, there, is, there is hope. Um, over the past few years, we've managed to secure some significant changes in government policy. Um, most notably, um, but for our campaigning work, um, every EU citizen in this country would have had to pay for their new status. Um, and through our campaigning work, we prevented that from happening. So millions of people were saved money by, by pressure that was put on through the campaigning work that we did. And it wasn't me, just me, it was the hundreds of people who helped and wrote to MPs and, and really supported us in that campaign work. Likewise, we achieved the only, only unifying vote um, in um, the House of Commons during this whole Brexit saga, which was around um, an amendment to ring fence, ring fence the rights of EU citizens and UK citizens in the European Union. It was the singular moment where everybody across the House, with the exception of the government, uh, both sides of the divide, united and said, no, EU citizens and the British citizens abroad need to be protected. Um, now, this is not to say everything is rosy, the government is holding fast on the physical documents issue, but we remain hopeful and we will continue with our campaigning work. And we hope that by spreading the word of the form and getting people to encourage people to contact and tell us their stories, ask your EU friends, tell them about it, give them a voice. It's really, really, really important. Um, and the, the, the other things that I wanted to mention um, were that Right now, we, whilst we don't have any solid campaigning, it is really important that people write to their MP and ask a very simple question. You're giving a physical backup to vaccine certificates. They've committed to that. They said they're going to do that. They obviously recognise that hundreds of thousands of people, um, some just won't be able to navigate the system. So they're doing that there, but they're not doing it under the settlement scheme. Why? And we just want a very simple answer to that question because we haven't had it yet. And finally, there is a massive programme of legis legislative change on the horizon coming from the, the United Kingdom government, masses of change, particularly in migration. And there are some really, really big opportunities coming up in terms of shaping and changing the narrative around migration in this country. Um, solidarity with EU citizens shouldn't just be with us, it should be with all migrants. And signing up to our newsletter, monitoring things on Twitter, will expose and surface campaigns to, to get involved and to show your solidarity and give us the support that we will need in the coming months and year ahead. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank, thank you, Luke. That was uh, a really clear presentation. Can I um, go straight to a question which is um, of, of great concern to us in the European movement, which is about our campaigning. We're looking at how we campaign going forward and uh, there's clearly a huge issue with the continuing status and support for the three stroke four stroke five million and you've raised a whole lot of questions some of which are clearly immediate to deal with the processing of uh, settled status applications and some of which are longer term if i if we're looking at um at medium term, so over the next two to three years, issues where we could consistently campaign for something that we might actually be able to affect for the better as the European movement. What, what do you think that might be, Luke? Because we're, we're trying to work that out at the moment and I'd, I'd really welcome your thoughts and that might provoke some more questions from, from colleagues in the chat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I maintain D despite my cloud of scepticism about a physical alternative, a physical backup to digital status, I do maintain that that is going to be a long-term fight and one that we will need continuing and ebbing and growing support on. Um, the proof, acquiring and proving status is not just about having a piece of paper in your hands. It is the ability and the fundamental connection between the individual and their legal rights to be in this country. And it will open the gateway and open the door to so many, many things if people are able to have that trusted you know, connection and relationship with their rights and their status. And a big part of that is 
supporting us in asking these questions and driving that agenda forward and gathering and, and soaking up that intelligence and that information. So that, that's that's one thing. That that's that's definitely something I think is is a medium term. The second thing is about, and this it gets a little bit technical, but the, it's really, really quite simple, really, in, in some ways, is what do we do about all those people who haven't applied and haven't yet got their status? How do we support them to achieving their status and protecting them until they get what they're entitled to? And we're doing quite a bit of work on this at the moment. We're building a, a package of um, ideas and solutions that we're hoping to float uh, and see if we can get somewhere with it. But ultimately, they, um, from what we, from where we are right now, they're broken down into into three things. Um, one, give people rights whilst their applications are pending. Those people who apply late, even if they put in an application, they have no rights until a decision is made. So imagine the shock of not being able, finding out that you're not being not able to work, and then you put in your application, you're still not able to work until you get a decision. That's a really simple fix. Just give people rights whilst they're waiting for a decision on their case. The second thing, for some people, the shock of identifying that they don't have a legal basis to be in this country could come with a debt, an NHS debt, of thousands and thousands of pounds based on, illeg on illegality in this country. So we ask that at the point when somebody is granted their status, that they are essentially, that period of unlawfulness is forgiven and forgotten. And all of the things that are associated with that error are washed away. So the people don't face these terrible situations where they could be liable for thousands and thousands of pounds of debt to the NHS for um, help and treatment, um, despite going on to regularise their immigration status. And the final thing, which is a bit more wishy-washy, but again, it's a really, really, it's a, it could really be a game changer in terms of how the hostile environment works in this country, which is introducing positive duties and positive obligations on to governments, local authorities, housing associations, NHS trusts, everybody, to rather than just turning somebody away and refusing them and continuing the destitution, continuing the struggle and denying them help, helping them, giving them, signposting them, referring them to support so that they can regularise and sort their immigration status out in an impartial and safe way. Much like what happens with the national referral mechanism for victims of modern slavery, when they are identified, they are immediately, well not immediately, but they are supported, they're emancipated from that situation and then put on the path to help. We don't have that situation for people who face illegality in this country. They just become further marginalized and pushed into the ground. So better, better paths to status, security whilst they're, they're applying and positive support for people to get that. That package of measures, which is still sort of in development, um, is going to be a really fundamental fight over the over the first few periods after the deadline in July. Um, so those are the two sorts of head-on things, if you like. Um, yeah. That's really helpful, Luke. Just a, a very specific question, which um, which has been raised in the uh, in the Q and A from Inga Lockington. Can EU citizens not download the electronic form so that they have it ready when needed? No, they cannot. Um, and um, you have to go through a checking system, a log, you have to log in to be able to access your status at each interval or acquire what's called a share code, which is then inputted into a website to then produce the status. There is nothing you can download. There is nothing you can print. It all exists behind a wall of questions, tests, telephone numbers and authentication. Do we have, I mean, that, that's very useful to know, do we, do you have any idea, Luke, what proportion of the five million may not, for one reason or another, have applied for settled status by the end of June? Do, do we have any idea what sort of numbers it, it's, people it's, are talking to their communities, people who, who aren't, aren't applying, and why they're not applying as well? It's a really good question, Andrew, <clears throat> but we don't know the numbers because 
by the very nature of the people who won't apply, it, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they are, because if we did, we'd target them <laughs> and we'd we help them. But there has been a lot of research that's been done into the characteristics based on you know analysis and by the Oxford Oxford Migration Observatory has done work and, and various other people. Um, so we do know roughly the characteristics. And in large, the, the reasons why they are unlikely to apply fold into two camps. One, um, they just don't know. They just information wise, this is completely passing by. Um, either because it's just something that they didn't think applied to them because they're so embedded and they're so in, in integrated into the UK society that they just think that they're part of the of UK life and it doesn't, you know, nothing more applies to them. Um, or they uh, just don't know, they, they you know, live in the middle of nowhere and don't have access to a phone. Or they can't apply because they are frail, they're all, they've got health problems um, and or they're prevented from doing so because they may be a victim of trafficking, slavery, domestic violence and so forth. So it's a complex picture, um, but the government, thankfully, to their credit, have a very flexible policy for people who do apply late. So that I doubt there will be an issue in terms of people actually being able to get their applications in. That's not the problem. The problem is everything in between because these people will face suffering and struggle um, before they get their status. Right now, we don't have the infrastructure that guides people to the solution. All that we have is a system, various systems that essentially punish people without directing them to the solution and protecting them until they get the outcome that they're entitled to. And that, that as I'm sure everybody will be very familiar with, has echoes of something that happened to a very small cohort uh, in comparison uh, to thousands of Windrush generation persons. Um, if we just take a step back and look at the numbers, even if say, for example, it's 3% of people that don't apply to the scheme, 3% of 5 million is a considerable number of people. It's a considerable amount. And 3%, the reason why I pick up on that number, is the UK conducted a transfer from analog to digital television a few years ago. It was considered to be the most successful conversion scheme ever in this country. In fact, it's lauded in the world because of how efficient it was. The rate of people that didn't apply, didn't do the conversion from analog to digital was 3%. So even in the most successful scheme, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, this is me putting high praise on the settlement scheme, it's very, very effective, but that is not to say that there will be problems. And even at its best, 3% mm -hmm. is a lot. Well, can, can I thank you, Luke and Belinda, for those really interesting presentations? And can I also say um, three things in conclusion? Firstly, this is all, as it were, work in progress. And we want to remain closely engaged, we as the European movement, want to remain closely engaged uh, with you as we start to see what's happening with the replacement schemes for the European funding schemes and what happens with the um, implementation of settled status. So uh, we're keen to remain engaged with you and I hope we can do maybe in a while another conversation like this. The second thing is, as I said in the Q and A. We're very keen because we're a, a campaigning organisation, the European Movement, and we're keen to become a mass membership organisation too. And I hope those of of you in who have joined Sydney who aren't members of the European Movement will join, because we're only as strong as our collective membership, and we're keen to frame actual campaigning objectives over the coming months. So we'd be very uh, keen to work with you. Linda and Luke on defining those objectives and let's make this an iterative process. And the third thing is there have been, qu there's been quite a lot in the chat about how can we get more involved in the European movement. Uh, I do um, uh, strongly urge you to um, go on the website, uh, find out your, the local group. We've got 150 European movement groups across the country and uh, uh, contact whoever runs that group and get involved. We also do regular briefings of this kind. We're all over social media now, so you can follow us on social media too. We're getting our campaigns going. You know, the Voices of Brexit that we've done and we published last week is, is, is just the beginning of what we're going to be doing since the um, Trade and Cooperation Agreement was 
uh, implemented and we're sort of in, as it were, actually in the, uh, in the hard Brexit period. So there's lots that you can do to get involved. And we hope to do regular webinars like this. So keep an eye out for them, join. Uh, you'll have noticed a lot of uh, comments and connections in the chat and people that you can make uh, uh, contacts with. If you want to contact me directly, um, I'm really delighted to um, meet virtually members directly and don't hesitate to email me. My email is adonisa, that's all one word, adonisa at parliament.uk. Let me have your thoughts. If you, if you can't find a contact for your local group uh, organiser, let me know and I'll put you in touch. And I'm also very happy to engage in dialogue with, with you on particular thoughts you've got of where we should be going on Europe and so on. So we're a, a very much a member engagement organisation, both to spread the word about Europe, but also to campaign for big and specific objectives. So thanks for giving up an hour this evening. A huge thanks to Linda and Luke. We can give them some applause for everything that they've done collectively. And they are doing actually to highlight these big issues can I also thank my colleagues, Scott and Matthew, who behind the scenes have made all this happen this evening. And can I say a big, big thanks to everybody who's joined this evening and hope to see you again soon. And as I say again, if you want to contact me directly, adonisay at parliament.uk. Thanks very much, everyone, and good night.